good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, you all are uh, forcing us to change our modus operandi and get started kind of on time. You know, mm -hmm. uh, for all our Houston Institute folks, you know, we usually don't do that. But on these lunch talks, I guess it's really important to do so. So, uh, my name is David Harris, and I want to welcome you to Harvard Law School. We're really pleased to have you, and uh, I want to give a special thanks to our co-sponsors for today's event, the HLS Urbanists. Uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education Office of Student Affairs, the Prison Studies Project, and the Transformative Justice Project. So I'm going to speak briefly. We have this unbelievable event today that's really important. And you know, I usually just kind of say something and get off the, get off the podium, but I, I want to make a couple of substantive comments. Uh, one, I will say that as I speak today in the big house over there, uh, Wasserstein, there's another event uh, that's uh, talking about a, a, a book that's written about monuments, right? And the current debate over monuments, and I don't know if you know, there's a debate going on here about the monument to Dr. King on the common and uh, about Faneuil Hall and its naming and all of that. And those are important conversations. But today, we're here to talk about a different kind of living monument. We're talking about streets named after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and, uh, and the importance and, 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 and a, a really a, a moral and practical imperative we have uh, to, to, to make sure that these streets uh, honor that legacy. So from our perspective at the Houston Institute, we have a project called the Houston Marshall Plan for Community Justice. And I don't usually refer to it, but on these events, which we call dispatches from the front lines of community justice, it's important to say that our project is based on the premise that every community in this country, especially communities of color, contain individuals and organizations who are doing work to rebuild and revitalize their communities despite active underdevelopment by public policies. And they're doing that in a way that gives voice to the people in the community who know, understand, identify problems, and understand and recognize solutions. So in that respect, we are really, really fortunate today to have with us Melvin White. Now I'm going to tell you a story. When I uh, tell people that, that I've, I've learned about Melvin White and I want to bring him to school, and I'll say, <clears throat> you know, this guy named Melvin White, they say, oh, who is he? Who is he with? Right? And so here in academia, you know, they think, oh, you know, what university is he with? What corporation is he with? Who is he? What's his credential? And I say to them, he's just a guy. Right? And that's, to me, high praise. Right? Because I think we want to work with the guys and gals in the community who are doing the work and not the people who have the credentials. So uh, again, I'm really, really pleased to be able to, to do this event today. Um, and I think there's another piece of this work that's important to emphasize, that our project is designed to rebuild cities. Uh, my sense is that this, one of the things I'm really excited about, Beloved Streets of America, is it's an opportunity to start and spread, right? Beyond the Martin Luther King streets. So with that, I want to just mention a couple of upcoming events. This weekend, uh, Friday and Saturday, we'll be hosting a major conference here on race, racism, and mental health. It'll be over there in the big house. Um, I invite you and encourage you to come. Um, and then on December 3rd, the Transformative Justice Project uh, will be presenting a film called This Ain't Normal which is a very powerful and gripping and somewhat disturbing film about uh, gangs here in Boston. And I encourage you to visit our website to learn more about that. So having said that, I have to make my usual shout out to Kelly Garvin, who makes these things happen and who is tirelessly now stuck in the office doing more work so she doesn't have to accept these accolades in person. Um, I also need to give a shout out to Isaac Gibbons, uh, a high school student who worked with us last year, uh, who, who brought Beloved Streets of America to our attention. It's now uh, uh, at UMass, but he did a gap year with us, and that was really incredible. And finally, you know, I often do these introductions without, I think, giving due praise and to the, folk, the other folks who make it happen, including the folks from IT. So, Bill, I want to thank you, uh, as well as folks from events and catering. Uh, who, uh, for whom, you know, we're thankful for the food. Uh, so now I want to introduce uh, uh, Aaliyah Evason, uh, uh, working with us, a graduate student uh, from the School of Design, uh, to introduce uh, Mr. White. 
Thank you, David. Hi, everyone. I am a fellow at the Houston Institute as well as a graduate student at the Design School. And I had the pleasure of first meeting Melvin in September. My studio took a trip to St. Louis, and we have spent the past semester looking at the spatial, racial, and economic disinvestment in the third ward of St. Louis. And part of that trip was meeting Melvin and hearing about his vision for how we can revitalize these streets and communities that are named after civil rights leaders such as Dr. King. And Melvin's vision, as you will come to see, is incredibly inspiring, and it is a cross-section of the opportunity to transform our communities and look at how systemic disinvestment has affected communities of color across the United States. So I'm so excited to welcome Melvin White and his colleagues and for you to hear more about his vision for the beloved streets of America. All right. Thank you. Hello everyone. Hello. My name is Melvin White and uh, first I want to thank uh, David Harris for having us out here today. Uh, we've been talking for the last seven months about coming down here to Harvard and he made it happen. So I want to thank, thank David for having us out here today. Um, before we get into the presentation, I wanted to mention a few people that's going to be working with us on our team and they wasn't able to make it. Uh, one of the guys name is Derek Alderman. Derek Alderman, Alderman is a historian of all MLK streets, and I had the pleasure of meeting him maybe about 10 years ago. And David, I mean, um, he will be in charge of um, the geography. He's a uh, president of the Association of Geographers, geographers and um, it's over 12,000 geographers up under him. And um, he'll be in charge of statistics and everything, and there are over 100 country, countries that they're in. So um, I want to mention him, as well as Dan Doka. He's actually here, located at Harvard. And he's the professor over the uh, Harvard Graduate Design School. And he'll be one of our lead architects on the project, as well as Derek Lauer over here. So I want to mention him as well. And lastly, I want to mention a guy named Hilton Kelly. And he's out of Port Arthur, Texas. And he's an uh, environmentalist. And so what he does is check the soil and make sure that there's no contamination. He checks buildings, makes sure there is no asbestos, and that's very important as we move into these, some of these under-advantaged neighborhoods to make sure that everything is safe once we start developing. And before we get into the presentation, I just want to show a short film about Beloved Streets of America and our CNN piece as we move forward. There's an American nightmare that's going on up and down King Drive. When a person says, hey, I'm uh, meeting down on one of the King Street, you know, most likely, it's going to be a dangerous environment. As we stand here today, we're uh, half a century away from the time that Martin Luther King came to Chicago to desegregate Chicago. And we face a lot of the same challenges today. I want to remind you today that we are not free in Chicago. He came in and talked about the ghettos that we were living in. He came and he lived on the west side of Chicago to demonstrate his commitment to breaking that cycle of poverty that had been ensconced and entrenched in Chicago. You see a very short summary of the black experience as you travel King Drive in Chicago. You'll see a progression of depression. We helped create a, another organization called Southside Critical Mass. That ride starts here at Cole Park on King Drive. When we started that ride, there were people who said, oh, y'all gonna meet at night? <laughs> on the south side? On the south side of Ride Bikes? I mean, there were people who were fearful. We know our neighborhoods are safer than the perception and the narrative tells us they are. It doesn't mean we're naive about violence in our neighborhoods. We ride to reduce violence. I think it would, he would be ashamed to walk up and down Martin Luther King. When I first moved here, we had shopping places up there. We had a music store up there. You see nothing. I see nothing. I don't even walk up there. Me, I do not want to go down Martin Luther King. 
Dr. King stood for unity, Dr. King stood for peace and justice, as well as economics. So to have a, such a negative stigma to be placed on the streets is kind of like a slap in the face of Dr. King's legacy. And so we're out to change that. We want to make people, when they get off the airplane, say, hey, I want to go to Martin Luther King. There's a nice restaurant. There's a nice jazz spot that we can go to. I would love to walk up to that court and see a statue of Martin Luther King. I'm 85 years old, be soon 86. I might not see that change, but God knows I wish I could. <laughs>
So back in 2004, as I was delivering mail up and down our MLK Street, I took a look at it, what was going on at that time. It was abandoned buildings, uh, trash, broken bottles everywhere, prostitution. It was actually open air drug markets at that time I was looking at. So I'm like, looked at the street sign and it just hit me at that time like, this is Dr. King. This is one of my heroes when I was coming up who I admired. So I'm looking at like, what's going on? This is this, something's not right. This picture doesn't add up. So um, at that time, I didn't know what a nonprofit was. I was like, I was just a postal worker. So, you know, postal workers, I know it's going to take a lot of resources to be able to change this condition. And, you know, postal workers at $50,000 a year, that's not, that's not going to do it. So I learned about how a nonprofit work. And if you can galvanize enough people behind your mission, they can contribute to it. Monetary-wise, any resources that they have, we can change it. So, um, and also, it was always a, the Chris Rock joke stood in the back of my mind. You know, he always said, if you're on Martin Luther King Street, you better run. So that always stuck in the back of my mind as well. So I'm like, um, I wanted to find out what it was like on these other Martin Luther King streets. So from 2004 to 2008, um, I traveled various MLK streets from um, Miami, Florida, Wilmington, Delaware, Houston, Texas. One of my first trips was to go, uh, I think we went to Chicago, Gary, Indiana, and Detroit, Michigan. And we made our little round trip. I had my digital camcorder, I would film these streets, get out, talk to the residents up and down these MLK streets, and get a feel for what was going on on these MLK streets. And so uh, Tacoma, Washington, Seattle, Washington, um, where else? Gary, Indiana, I've already mentioned, Washington, D.C. So over that period of time, we might have went to 15 different MLK streets up until 2009. And it was the same type of feel that you got from our MLK street. So I know that this was a national problem that existed uh, around the country. So 2009, we formed a nonprofit organization called the Beloved Streets of America. And we used the word beloved because Martin Luther King always spoke about beloved communities. And of course, this is a national initiative, so we call it Beloved Streets of America. 2010, uh, we got an office located on Martin Luther King Street in, in St. Louis, Martin Luther King Street in Hamilton. And I wanted to get right there in the so-called hood, so to speak, to be able to engage with the community to try to change the mindset and mind frame of the community. So uh, for about 10 months straight, we got out what we had called community day giveaways. We would get out and have food drives, clothing drives, toy drives, cleanups, uh, we had music, everything to try to uplift the community as well as getting our message, message out as well. So during that time period, we were able to gain a little momentum and people start taking notice of what we were doing. So uh, we started getting news on the news, CNN, MSNBC, The Guardian, all local news channels um, started to take notice of what our initiative stood for and what it meant. Um, also, 2013, we won the Rosa Parks Award from Washington University. That was exciting as well because that was the first time an organization had been in existence as short as ours had been. I think we had been two years in. That normally goes out to an organization who's been in existence for 20 years or so. So that was exciting for us to take home that Rosa Parks Award for great community service and great community work. Um, up until 2015, I got a call from my man Dan uh, Doka. He's right here at Harvard. He's the uh, professor of the design school. He said, hey, I want to... Um, I found out about your mission and I wanted to uh, have my students take, use your initiative as a project. You know, he wants to, so he brought 21 of his students, architect students, landscape architects up to St. Louis and they wanted to try to um, look at buildings to try to give beloved streets some um, ideas on how to design and, and take some of these abandoned buildings as uh, a project for us. So uh, we, took a, we flew to Washington, D.C. as well to took a look at Washington, D.C. and St. Louis MLK Street and kind of compared the same thing. And um, so December of that year, I flew back to Harvard and they kind of showcased their work, what they came up with, some of the designs, some of the plans, and we can use some of those plans today as we move forward. 
And Dan said, he said, this was an important class because it was something different than he ever had because this touched on social, racial, economics, and everything. So it was kind of different than what the class he normally had. So he was like, this was a great class for his uh, students. So for, fast forward to 2018. That's where we're at right now. We're partnering with Global 1000, Dr. McCarthy, and uh, we have a national MLK Street Initiative. That's what we call it. And it's a 51 city initiative where we plan to go to various MLK streets doing revitalization work on these MLK streets. We want to launch this January 15th and we want to use 51 cities because it's significant of 51 years since his untimely assassination. So we chose 51 cities to go to, to revitalize and bring Dr. King's legacy, the respect that it deserves. Okay. Also, with this initiative, we want to um, focus on um, urban agriculture, housing, adequate housing, um, social programs, um, programs for the youth, health and nutrition. Several things that we want to focus on is lacking in these type of communities that bears Dr. King's name. So we want to lay emphasis on these type of things as we go and visit these MLK streets. Some of the programs that we have right now currently, one of them is called Mentors in Motion. Mentors in Motion takes uh, undeserved youth in the community and um, teach them robotics, um, health and behavior assessments, workforce development, and cultural and arts development. Another program that we have is Youth Build. Uh, we're fortunate enough to partner with Youth Build. Youth Build is a national organization and it's run by, the St. Louis chapter is run by Julia Tibbs. And what Youth Build does is they take youth between the ages of 16 to 24 and teach them construction skills. And I think that's very important with our initiative because it can teach, the, as we start to redevelop these neighborhoods, we can use those youth as far as um, redeveloping and construction skills. So that's exciting as well. And um, also, last thing that we're part, one of the things that we're partnering with is uh, Sweet Potato Project. And so Sweet Potato Project is ran by a guy named Sylvester Brown out of St. Louis. And what they do is they take vacant lots and they use, uh, as a summer program, the students come and plant and harvest on these vacant lots. And um, what they do is not only just plant and harvest, you're teaching them entrepreneurs entrepreneurial skills as well. So they're learning how to dis distri distribute and sales and all kind of things that they're learning in this process of um, uh, taking these vacant lots. And lastly, I want to talk about our urban agriculture initiative, which is uh, exciting as well because with the urban agriculture initiative, as we all know, most of these areas are food deserts. There's no fresh food in that at those areas and you have to go miles and miles away just to get fresh vegetables and um, we were fortunate enough to win a grant from Wells Fargo for our urban agriculture initiative where we we actually have an aeroponic system and uh, it grows about this grows 30 it's about this high and it grows 32 plants and you're using that's an example of what it looks like and you're using 1% um, water of what you normally use the roots go upside down and so the plants are getting the freshest nutrients, the most nutrients they can get. So these vegetables will be five times fresher than the vegetables that you get in your local grocery stores that's out here. So that's exciting as well. Also, um, we want to have what you call um, whole food stores up along MLK streets. And that way, because we can produce our own vegetables, lettuce, tomatoes, we're producing our own vegetables. And also we're partnering with an organization in St. Louis that um, produces his own supplement line, meaning, you know, things for high blood pressure, diabetes, because those are the things that are affecting a lot of people that's up and down these MLK streets. So that's exciting as well. Um, one of our success stories I want to talk about is one of my guy right here, Brandon Crosby. He's from Indianapolis. And I want him to get up and uh, talk a little bit about some of the success that he's having on his MLK Street down in Indianapolis. And uh, I want everybody to welcome Brandon, Brandon Cosby. Good 
Good afternoon. Um, Indianapolis is uh, one of those really unique places that, that most folks are surprised that there's actually a significant African American community there. Um, I represent an organization called Flanner House. Uh, we are 120 years old this year. Um, land and money was donated by a man named Frank Flanner, uh, who runs a funeral home service, and he hired Booker T. Washington. Uh, to come to Indianapolis to create an organization that was specifically designed and focused to move African Americans from positions of instability to positions of self-reliance and self-determination. 120 years later, our mission hasn't changed. Um, I was hired in January of 2016 uh, to take over the organization that was basically on the brink of closure. Uh, part of our work in recognizing that if we were really going to resurrect the history of this agency was to really look around the country to see who was doing the kind of work that we as an organization ought to be doing. So as I'm Googling and I look and I, all of a sudden I see this beloved Streets of America uh, and begin reading and so Melvin and I played phone tag for about a month and started talking about the opportunity that we had in Indianapolis uh, was to engage in both a public and private partnership with the city, uh, with uh, LISC, which is the Local Investment Support Corporation, um, and the Tourism Bureau. Uh, that basically makes the argument that in Indianapolis there ought to be at least 10 great places that if folks come in from out of town where they ought to be able to come and see culture, art, and communities that are thriving. And particularly among those 10, there ought to be thriving, evidentiary-based African-American communities. And so that was the work that we embarked on, and we convinced the city that make the Northwest neighborhood, the area in which we serve, uh, the 46208 zip code is the most violent zip code in the city of Indianapolis. It has the second highest former incarcerated release rate in the entire state of Indiana, uh, and is the largest food desert, not only in the city, but in the entire state. Uh, and we were able to convince them uh, that our neighborhood was that neighborhood that could, with a significant level of investment and opportunity, that we would be able to turn things around. Um, so on the agricultural side of it, taking on the issue around food desert, we believe in looking at a collective impact model of how, if we're going to tackle this issue around food insecurity and food justice, uh, then do it in the context of also doing youth asset development and crime prevention with the same dollar. Uh, so we created an initiative called FEED. It's farming, education, employment, and distribution. And we take young men and women ages 16 to 24 uh, who have been kicked out, pushed out, or dropped out of school, adjudicated or justice involved, as the, as the kids have told me the term is that they prefer, um, <laughs> which basically means they know law enforcement a lot better than they would like. Um, and we provide them with an educational opportunity to get their GED or their high school equivalency. Uh, that they learn everything about urban agriculture from seed to cultivation to harvest. Um, and then even learn on the distribution and supply chaining side. They negotiate commercial contracts with restaurants and distributors there in the city, um, as well as sell directly to the community. Uh, a 1.9 acre farming project that launched in 2017 in year one. Um, those young men and women produce 50,000 pounds of food for that neighborhood and community. As we are wrapping up year two, uh, they broke the 75,000 pound mark last Friday before I left for the weekend. Uh, and those are the, uh, that's the idea. And so as we're negotiating a contract, one young man who was standing next to me, he leaned over to me and he whispers in my ear, he said, uh, Yo, did you know you just made a deal to sell basil for more than you can sell weed? <laughs> 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 to which I responded, that's the idea. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, is I know a lot of old farmers, but I don't know any old drug dealers. That's right. And so the idea is really around creating the capacity for our young men and women to go from a position who were very much responsible for terrorizing our neighborhood to being in a position of redemptiveness and restorative practice of feeding the neighborhood. And so we just broke ground on our grocery store and cafe that will follow the same exact model. Uh, we've been able to disrupt the food market in the city uh, by undercutting. We sell organic produce at 70% below uh, retail costs directly to the most economically vulnerable community in the city. Um, there are a number of other things that I could go on about. Uh, this is a brochure, and I didn't bring enough of them with me, and I'm kicking myself for it, but I'd be happy to talk with you further about it. Um, but the beautiful part of it is that the synergy of the talk around this beloved community, 
right? Um, that a lot of times people, when they talk about Dr. Martin Luther King, they think about it in this peaceful, uh, passive context without understanding that the beloved community that Dr. King referred to was a community of resistance, right? It was a community from which we come together to draw strength, to do the, the heavy lifting of pushing back against systemic oppression. Um, that work has been bolstered in Indianapolis by the partnership that we have been able to have with Melvin and the work that they're doing in St. Louis. And we're excited and eager to be able to see how many other cities and communities that we can bring on board to engage in the process with us. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to show a short video next. And um, I want this video and uh, my business partner, Dr. Elance McCarthy, he'll be explaining about his company and how we have merged as a partnership for this national MLK Street Initiative. Welcome, Dr. E. Lance McCarthy. And we're super excited about the partnership uh, with Global 1000, Beloved Streets of America, and our National MLK Street Initiative. You cannot solve economic problems with social solutions. Over four years ago, people saw around the world over 10 million tweets with reference to Michael Brown laying on the ground for hours. And we believe that there was a message that we wanted to tell the world, and that is focusing on economic development. And so we created Ferguson 1000 over four years ago to look at how we could create 
jobs in the Ferguson and St. Louis community in order to move our agenda forward and help revitalize Ferguson and St. Louis. We started with 17 companies and 200 people in a small church in Ferguson. Our last event in St. Louis was over a thousand people with over a hundred companies and we were able to infuse job creation in our local model. The first thing we did was disrupt the traditional job fair. We call it hiring events. People actually were hired on the spot. 32% of the people who come to our events are hired on the spot or a second interview. Free suits, free haircuts, expungement services, and a prayer chapel. Having a comprehensive model that really changes lives. We believe from the biblical side, it doesn't take 40 years for 11 day journey. Once we got the model together, we decided to take it around the country. And as an economist, that's great, but I had to find some flavor. So I called my great friend, Ray Lewis, the NFL Hall of Famer, Jeff Hoffman, co-founder of Priceline, Richard McCoy, a major urban development specialist, and we began to move around the country. We went to Baltimore, and in 52 days, we had 52 companies, uh, 800 people, and again, 30% of people were hired on the spot. We also then added the Black Tech Initiative, having black tech firms pitch to us to be able to move our agenda forward. From Baltimore, we went to Los Angeles, 2,000 jobs there, from Los Angeles to Chicago, Chicago to Miami, and then Detroit. And our objective is to really create a comprehensive program and to work at Beloved Streets that we will be the job creation and black tech initiative. Because as you'll see, there'll be a lot of real estate development that'll be happening, but we'll need immediate opportunities for job creation. One of the things we're very excited about in our tech initiative is prison tech. We have ex-felons who have their own technology company. One of the guys' name came and created an opportunity uh, called Gun Bail. He had sent the prison, prison for uh, over 15 years for murder, but he wanted to create an opportunity to get guns off the street. So his platform says if you're able to turn in an unregistered gun, you can get out of jail for $99. Only eight months out of prison, we were able to take him to the state legislature. Another gentleman who created an opportunity who went to prison for marijuana, and we know that now on the slate, some of those are legal. Well, he saw the opportunity where prisoners were being gauged by their phone bills. He created an opportunity that would delete or decrease their phone bills by 40%. I said, Frederick, how did you get a contract with the prisons? You're an ex-felon. He said, I was able to sell the technology to their loved ones. He has 2 million customers, and I met him at the White House. In addition to being able to do prison tech, we find young tech, and we'll find these in streets all across the country that bear MLK programs. We have an eight-year-old who created his own app and his own game within 30 minutes. We have an eight-year-old vegan chef who has his own mobile app as well as development piece. We have a young man who bought the domain for the largest fashion house in the world, Balenciaga, because he heard about a rapper. He was able to buy the, the domain. Uh, they came at him and said that your infringement rights on trademark, well, of course he didn't, they bought it back for $50,000 within two weeks. He goes on YouTube and says, when I grew up, the players and the drug dealers were cutting their $100. Now I'm cutting this cherry, we got $100 for $50,000 and said, I'm making money on flipping technology. So we believe that there are stars in the communities all across this country. We believe that we can find them and be able to move this agenda forward. We're very excited about being the job model and the Black Tech Initiative through the Beloved Streets Project. And as we approach January, we believe we'll continue to move forward with Martin Luther King's agenda. A couple of other quick testimonies. Not only do we change people's lives in the black tech, but we do these hiring events. Our lives change in one day. What a young lady that was there at 6.30 in the morning. We said, are you here to work? She said, no. If I don't get hired today, I'm going to prison on Monday. We're able to get her hired on the spot. We had an 80-year-old man who walked three steps of flights and said, I still have work in me. We have a young lady who came with a wife beater. We said, sister, you can't come in here with that on. We have to be able to have dress for success. She began to cry. We said, why are you crying? I just got out of a halfway house. That's all I have. We're able to put clothes on her and be able to get her hired. So this model is a business model geared toward the injustices in our country, and we're very excited to be working with Beloved Streets of America to be able to go all across this country, find these talent, and be able to turn these cities around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're very excited about working with Global 1000 as we move forward toward this National MLK Street Initiative. Um, next up is uh, Derek Lauer, and uh, I met Derek maybe about seven years ago, and uh, he's been 
helping with the project for over seven years in architecture skills and um, and as you can see, the legacy park he designed. He's going to explain about the legacy park and some of the things that he's doing for beloved streets of America on the architecture side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good name is Derek Lauer. I'm glad to be here. I had a special connection to Boston. Studied at Berkeley College of Music a long time ago, and uh, my cousin was studying architecture here at Harvard, and that's kind of what got me uh, hooked into it. I'm the last of the old generation. I got my master's degree with the pencil. You know, um, so anyhow, um, this, this park design was when I inherited. There was a, a, a African American architect who had passed away who had originally done the park design, and so I took that over from Melvin, and we worked it into a more pragmatic um, uh, design. And the whole point here is to create a hearth, a center point for each of the neighborhoods that are going to be revitalized, so that you have a gathering place, a place to have the farmers market, and there'll be uh, uh, there'll be pieces around the park that will give. Uh, inspirational um, pieces from what Martin Luther King said and other cultural leaders. So we think that it's a repeatable, easy, cheap thing to build that can uh, be a center point. But more than that, um, it's really talking about we have this problem that we've identified, which is that the neighborhoods are in a bad shape. What do you do about it? So here's our solution. What we're talking about is having a three-part solution where the first thing you do is fix up things that can be done with just elbow grease. So that means pick up the litter, cut back the overgrowth, board up the buildings, stabilize some of the structures, and these things can have immediate visual impacts. Once all of a sudden you've uh, cut, you know, trimmed the, the overgrown grass, you see that immediately as a street being cleaned up. And this doesn't cost much of anything. The second point is that the buildings themselves that are in such a dilapidated state provide an opportunity and an asset. And then what you do is you use local carpenters, you train them with carpentry skills, you're putting money back into local people to fix up the buildings. Once you've done that, you've created an entrepreneurial opportunity for a business to be located that they couldn't normally have, say a new nail salon that couldn't afford to fix up the space, but now it's been renovated. In the second phase, part of that is also that you have to have an economic engine. So that's where we start talking about the, the hydroponics and the food production, because all of a sudden you have to have something that generating money as well. <coughs> the third uh, phase is at this point you've already cleaned up the streetscape, you fixed up some buildings, you're seeing some new business activity, now you're drawing in the developers. You want to get people who are capitalists who can see that they can make money off of this area. And so when we, I'll show you some of our budget strategies and some of that, but it's based off of the idea that the first thing doesn't cost very much at all, the second thing it puts money back in the community, and the third thing is where people are making money off of it and it's a vibrant community. So that's sort of where we're looking, <clears throat> the idea of clean up, repair it, and improvement. Um, you know, what we'd like to see in the, um, ultimately with the neighborhood improvements are gonna be things like shops and neighborhood markets, par parks, playgrounds, community centers, pedestrian plazas, uh, security substations, that's gonna be an important key part. Um, museums and galleries, but really more towards, geared towards African-American art, but also social conscious messages and things like that. Um, and then, of course, the youth, pro youth programs. And so we think that this is a key point that <clears throat> you have to do all these things at the same time. You can't just fix up the buildings and not do the social programs. You can't do the social programs without having some economic generator happening at the same time. So one of the other things is talking about the actual physical street itself. So that means that um, you know, fixing the curbs, making them more handicap accessible, street lights, benches. Um, one of the things about the hydroponic system is once you run the nutrient enriched water over the roots constantly, the nutrients start to deplete after a bit of time. Well, that nutrient enriched water can still be used to grow ornamental plants, for example. Uh, so now all of a sudden you're using the same food production to then beautify the streetscape. And with, um, along with that, we meant to mention that with the hydroponics, we're also doing aquaponics, which means that you're, one of the byproducts of growing um, plants sometimes is heat. And you use the heat to um, grow tilapia fish. You use the waste from the trap of fish to use as nutrients. You can use uh, the local uh, food <coughs> waste in digesters to, to generate methane. You know, and then now you're generating electricity. So it's those type of holistic systems that work together. Um, so <clears throat> again, first thing, immediate visual impacts. Second, repair, restore, and then implement the social program. So we feel that that's an important key. Uh, one of the things that has to be done uh, in uh, 
going through each of these streets is nationwide is going to have to go through and analyze each of the areas, each of the properties, prioritize what needs to be done. And so we've put together a team. Uh, I've got uh, contractors, people who design you know, electrical, mechanical, plumbing systems, the civil engineers, landscaping. I've got a construction manager. I've got an architectural team that I'm a part of that has an architect in every city in the country. So as we move forward with construction drawings, and we'll be able to have signed and sealed drawings wherever we need. Um, <clears throat> And then again, sort of the resources that we end up with is that we're able to provide job placement, education assistance, child care, building maintenance and repair programs. So again, if there's a facade of a business and they can't necessarily afford to fix it up themselves, come to Beloved Streets, we'll fix it up for you. You know, it's that type of thing. Healthcare facilities, litter pickup. New, um, and then the new development, we're talking about small residences, new apartments, new uh, retail, new commercial. And oh, one last thing, this is really important, that it's about creating an entertainment district too. Because if you do these things and you build the houses and you have jobs, but there's not a center or reason to go there, well then it's, it's not as strong as if you have a destination place. What we're talking about is along our eight block section of Martin Luther King in St. Louis, we created an entertainment district that has African American food, crafts, culture, that type of thing, where you can go get that flavor of St. Louis that you can't necessarily get in one spot right now. It's kind of spread out. Um, and so we see that as a way of celebrating the, the culture as well, and it's also as a way of guaranteeing that there'll be vibrant business opportunities. Right. And again, part of that is based around the idea of having a centerpiece, uh, of, a piece to gather, have rallies, learn about Dr. King's message, place to mobilize the community, um, to enhance the pride, self of ownership in the neighborhood. And that's a real important thing that the, the people that live there feel that it's their place and that's why it needs to be a better place. And you do that by understanding the message of Dr. King. Um, how much is it going to cost? Um, so we've gone through a bunch of uh, different analysis about it. And so in my experience, let's say uh, a house that's been vacant for 20 years, no roof, this type of thing, you can pick it up for 500 to 5,000 bucks. It takes about 100,000 to fix it up. So you got new roof, floor, systems, all that. Once you've done that, it's worth about 60,000 to sell. So it's a shortfall. Now, if we were talking about <clears throat> for each house, 100,000, so let's say you had $2 million to work with, well, then you can do 20 houses. But if you look at the point that you're trying to help, um, co you know, contractors who are out there trying to flip houses on their own, you only have to cover that shortfall. So now that same $2 million, can cover 50 projects. He's only trying to give them that $40,000 to make it the equation balance. So, and you take that on the scale of the commercial, let's say you have a million dollar renovation for a building to make it uh, viable as a commercial location. Again, the, the, the equation just doesn't balance because once you put in the work, it's not worth as much as you put in. But out of that million dollars, you give them 400,000 benefit. Now all of a sudden, now that same $2 million, you can generate uh, five brand new commercial projects. So. So we start saying, on an order of scale, we're talking about, in St. Louis, we're talking about just eight blocks out of an eight mile stretch of road. It's still a drop in the bucket. Two million bucks, five million bucks. So, and then we start talking about 50 cities. So more or less the math um, runs that <clears throat> in the first phase, we would have the park, an office set up, this type of thing in any city. The phase one, $2 million, $4 million, we get you $2 million of residential construction, $2 million of commercial construction. That's enough to show activity in the neighborhood. And then after that, um, $15 million would be the next round of investment. The $60 million investment for phase three, that's not to be raised. At that point, that's capitalism. That's, that's entrepreneurship happening. So we're not trying to raise all that money. Um, and how do you go about doing this? It's got to be a combination. It can't be all in the government. It can't be all in private donator, donations. It's kind of that combination of grants, fundraising, corporate sponsorship. Um, let, me, let me scoot past one slide here. So in this, in this summary, what you'll see is how that works out on the, on the macro scale. That if you were talking about per city, 5 million per city, 50 cities. So for just the first phase of cleanup, 250 million. You know, the second phase, we're talking 15 million per city, which again is those 20 new projects. At 50 cities, that's another three quarters of a million. So really, a billion dollars to get to the first two phases is what we're talking about. 
And ultimately, if you're talking about an $80 million investment in 50 cities, uh, $60 million, and then you're at $3 billion. So we are talking about $4 billion to fix up eight blocks in 50 cities. That's still a drop in the bucket. But it's also the type of thing, I'm not talking about that whole $4 billion to be invested. We're talking about that first $250 million. At that point, it's created a general mass that this is starting to roll. And whether or not that second amount, phase two, needs to be even raised is yet to be seen. But it's the type of thing that you pick small little pieces. You do the things that we've done with elbow grease. You make those small improvements. You get the community involved. And, um, and that's where we're at. So let me hand it back over to, uh, to Melvin. And, uh, oh, thanks. Uh, oh, thank you, Dave. Appreciate you, man. Good looking out. Okay, um, I guess we all need to come on up. And uh, I'm going to let Dr. Lance do a quick spiel right quick. And then we'll get to a video. And then I'll close it out with the conclusion of the program. So you've seen a lot of information on where we're going, examples of what has been done, and then strategy on budget. How do we move there? What is the ask today? It's two things particularly. As we move to the uh, fourth sector, and in the economics, we are now in the fourth sector because we have the private sector, the government sector, the community sector, and now the fourth sector is a sector that does double bottom line, social entrepreneurship. And we believe that this model can do that. Also, with the Opportunity Fund and Opportunity Zones, we believe there's a large amount of capital being deployed to urban America, and we won't be that model. So the ask is two things. One, we want the university, Harvard University, with all its departments, to be our research arm, to assist us in doing research all across different departments to move this agenda forward. This could be a way that we really can assist in rebuilding urban America. And then the second part, of course, is the capital formation side. And we believe that public-private partnerships and the Opportunity Fund can deploy that capital to the marketplace. So those are two things we want to be able to uh, have your assistance with and be able to move this agenda forward and have some real quantifiable objectives of changing urban America around the country. And as I said earlier from the onset, you cannot solve economic problems with social solutions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's it. All right, all right. As we move forward, we have one last video, and this is our vision of what a beloved community should look like. And um, we're going to pop this video, last video in, and I'll, we can conclude it with a uh, letter that I had wrote for uh, um, one of our local newspapers. in 
our vision across the America, some of the things we want to implement up along these MLK streets across the country. And lastly, as we conclude this program, I wanted to read an article that I that was posted in uh, St. Louis, local St. Louis newspaper. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is one of America's most distinguished African Americans. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, organized some of America's biggest civil rights protesters, marched, stood for diversity, and is recognized worldwide for his model of nonviolent civil disobedience. Now is the time for St. Louis and the nation to change the stigma that has been placed on these many MLK streets. We have money for Nike, Ralph Lauren, baseball stadiums, but little money for communities that surround streets that bears Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s name. During the 1960s, MLK Street in St. Louis was named Eastern Avenue. It was bustling with businesses, diversity, and jobs. It was a place where you felt safe and could take your kids to a movie on a Saturday. J.C. Penney's, Woolworths, and many mom and pop stores thrived. In 1972, as the streets was declining, the name was changed to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Fast forward to 2018. There are vacant lots, abandoned buildings, and little, little economic vitality. We all have to ask ourselves, is this the way to honor Dr. King? Not only in St. Louis, but Senegal, Israel, Zimbabwe, France, and Australia is reflected on many of these streets that bears Dr. King's name. Most are predominantly African-American communities. It is hard to evaluate the truth in negative stereotypes, though one report suggests that residents of these neighborhoods with MLK streets are $6,000 poorer than those without. It's ironic that we have attached the name of the most famous civil rights leader of our time to the streets that speak to the very pressing need to continue the progress of the civil rights movement. Cities have spent money on highways and tourist attractions that transfer wealth to the rich while demolishing African-American neighborhoods in the process. In the suburb of Ladue, that's a suburb in St. Louis, it's 94% white with a medium household income 
of 177,000. Seven miles away on MLK Drive, the community is 94% black with a medium income of only 22,000. Beloved Streets of America is leading a very important national MLK Street initiative. This major project calls for St. Louis to be the model for the nation to reflect what an MLK street can be by bringing back jobs, introducing the area to urban agriculture, solar energy, black culture, and history. The goal is to get rid of the, rid of the neg negative stigma that has been placed on communities bearing Martin Luther King Jr.'s name. We will begin in St. Louis and go from city to city, redeveloping neighborhoods across the country surrounding MLK streets. We need everyone across the nation to contribute by donating resources to fix this problem and give Dr. King's legacy the respect that it deserves. Support the beloved Streets of America and the National MLK Street Initiative. And we all have to remember, it's not a black thing, it's the right thing. So that's it. So thank all four of you for being here today and for sharing this vision with us. Um, I know some of you probably have to leave, but we have time to take a couple of questions if anyone has something that they would like to ask of these four brilliant humans. Right on. Uh, you're doing the right thing, that's for sure. Uh, just generally speaking, I'm a, I'm a retired professor at the School of Public Health and Medical School, and I didn't hear much about health in your presentation, and public health in particular, lead poisoning, asthma, infant mortality, uh, violence, of course. And I just wonder whether or not that's, a, that's been a focus of your attention. Yes, sir. And how the Most definitely. Yeah. But one of the crucial things that I've discovered in my own research is the importance of the people uh, who live in neighborhoods believe in themselves. They believe that they can take action that makes a difference. And, then a certain amount of trust is necessary to generate that. Uh, but it seems like, uh, while you say that social programs can't solve economic issues, mm -hmm. economic condition, economic uh, incentives and economic action can't solve social, cultural, historical problems necessarily. I think we need it all. Yes. But I think that it's important to create a focus in your in your in your work on public health. Uh, aspects. I can I can tell you about the work that in Indianapolis um, we we framed our entire um, theory of action around an acronym of livability, opportunity, vitality, and education. And particularly around livability is where we tackle all of those those aspects. And, we, and particularly we promote a, a platform of seven dimensions of wellness. Uh, we work with an organization uh, that a, an executive director who's organization is now located in our facility. Her name is Rhonda Bayless, and it's the Center of Wellness for Urban Women. Um, and so working through that dimension, uh, through those seven dimensions, um, we, we very much take that on. We've even begun to the point of uh, working, it's, it, it helps to have a major corporation like Eli Lilly in our backyard. Um, and the Lilly Global Health Initiative is actually sponsoring two neighborhood advocates specifically looking at health-related issues. I mean, we are even now beginning to get doctors to write prescriptions for healthy food. Um, so individuals, low income folks from the neighborhood can actually bring their prescription to the farm um, and, and have it filled with all of our organic produce at no cost to them. And so we, we I 100% um, agree with you. Uh, and and that's, that's part of the work that we have to be able, it's not an either or, it's a both and and being able to understand that um, we can't do well if, we're, if, if, if we can't be well. Right. So I have a question of, of Lance. Um, I hope you can say a little bit more now, but I'd be willing to connect with the team later. I, I want to understand uh, very clearly, what is the request? What is the ask of Harvard? You said a little bit about it up there, but could you say more? What, what are the two or three most ideal things that you think would benefit uh, in a partnership from Harvard? Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, we would love to have 
uh, a research arm with Harvard across all the different departments. So if that is the design school, that is the, the business school, uh, even theology school, to really dive deep and look at how we could use your great um, uh, platform of research to help us on that side. That's one piece. The second piece, of course, is the capital raise. I mean, you all have alumni all around this world uh, that we believe if they saw the benefits of this program that they would invest in their perspective. Uh, and I haven't seen a um, university of this magnitude dive deep like this. We just believe it would be a perfect marriage for, for both our sides. And I, just, I just want to chime in here that uh, <clears throat> Dr. Tony Earls from the School of Public Health uh, is part of what we need uh, right. in, within this agenda. So I, I also want to say I'm really glad that we have people here from across the university, and that's, that's one of the goals that we have of putting this event on. Someone else? Hi, I'm a first year at the Divinity School, and I'm interested in talking to you afterwards about doing my part about researching what I can do, and I'm from Memphis, and so I'm interested in hearing about y'all and I'm thinking about like in my short like 22 years of life just how much drastically has changed at MLK Boulevard in Memphis so like now we have the FedEx form with the Grizzlies play and then like I know like housing projects where like a lot of black people was pushed out and now we have like this a lot of revitalization but there's still some parts that like haven't been touched so I've just been thinking about that and now it's interesting how like who's doing the revitalization so like I, it's important that like people from the communities are like right. having it and then instead of like kicking so many people out so I just appreciate what y'all are doing to make me think about my home and then also what I can do here as a Harvard student. So. Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Can I... One thing I didn't say, we, we uh, work very close to the faith-based community around the country and we'll continue to do this with the MLK uh, initiative. We actually have the churches register people for their hiring events. And so they come back and have testimony Sunday where they come back on Sunday and to share that they got a job by coming to the hiring event. So we integrate the community and the faith-based organizations as an outlet to the community. Yes. Um, I'd just like to offer maybe a couple of thoughts. Um, in every state there is an office called the uh, Division Office of the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, and it's through that office that most of the resources come from the U.S. Department of Transportation to the states and to the locales. Uh, I think that that might be um, a wonderful source of uh, resources for you. Uh, secondly, um, you mentioned Eli Lilly, and I know that uh, uh, John Lettleiter just stepped down as the uh, chair of United Way Worldwide. And I think an organization like that and others of that type could also be very, very uh, helpful to you. Uh, and then finally, um, I'm the uh, chair of our uh, foundation at my law firm, and we do a lot of public policy work, and I think that uh, we could be helpful, especially when it comes to tapping various agencies of the federal government. Uh, and then, <laughs> lastly, during my time as uh, U.S. Secretary of Transportation, we actually focused on the naming of what we called All America Roads. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there is really some, um, I think, receptivity uh, there within the Department of Transportation to uh, respond to an invitation like this. Sounds great, great. Yes, sir. So again, I, I, I have to say that <clears throat> I, I, I thank uh, Rodney Slater for coming today because, uh, in a, and it's a, it's a tribute to, to this idea yes, that, that we have turned out the kind of people we have. And, uh, uh, you know, and I think uh, we're very fortunate. I want to make a couple of points to everybody that uh, we are going to post on our website materials from, that you've heard about from everybody here. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to visit the site, to follow up uh, as you can. And I also want to say that, unfortunately, uh, Professor Doak couldn't be with us today, but he's with us in spirit. He had a faculty meeting that he had to go to, so uh, he couldn't bow out of that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, I think, if, are, there, are there any other questions I'm concerned about? Some of you all get into class. Uh, <laughs> are there other questions? Okay, well, will you all please join me in one more round of applause for all of these wonderful people? And we will 
please keep up to date with what we're doing here at the Institute. We will have a class in partnership with the Ed School this winter that is called Beloved Streets of America, where we'll be, we will be diving into this topic further and looking how we can work across discipline here at Harvard to um, support this project. So thank, thank you, you all thank for you. coming. Thank you all.